thank you so much. Um, it's a huge pleasure for me to be here, especially when you know how horrible student I was when I was in seventh grade. So, <laughs> yeah, my, my my title will be "What Can a Squirrel Tell?" So I will study a squirrel, technically calligraphy, with you through my session. So I have distributed some very simple stuff with regard to what calligraphy is. So how many of you have taken a look? I, I have distributed two readings about Chinese calligraphy. Anyone receives that? Oh, it's not a big problem. Thank you for having already <laughs> said that. So some very brief introduction in the very beginning about myself. So I was born in Shanghai. So everyone, anyone been to Shanghai or? Oh, great, 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 great. Shanghai is here. So when I was a kid, my parents was working and studying in Japan, Yokohama and Kyoto. Uh, Yokohama and Kyoto, which is by and large here. So from, a, from the perspective of a kid, so this might be a really, really long distance to travel from Shanghai to here, right? The secret I can tell you is that there's a small island here. And still today, if you go there by shipping boats, it takes two hours. So it is very substantial distance. If you think through the distance between China and Japan in this way. And then when I grew up and I go abroad and I study elsewhere, Europe, United States, things like that, and I realize there's a distance between China and Japan, maybe not the longest. <laughs> well, there are other longer ones. <laughs> but also, that is because I, studied, I started to conceptualize East Asia in a different way. So this is a book cover by a wonderful scholar, Amino, who is a favorite scholar of mine and my friends. So what is unique about this map? Well, the perspective looking down from the northern. Backwards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Not backwards. So you're trying to see the East Asia in a somehow different way, right? So this is Japan, right? So you're seeing from the north. So what might be different from the perspective of this map? Any suggestion? What do you feel? Yeah, definitely, the orientation is different. So my, yeah? Uh, what I see is uh, that the sea right there, and um, you know, it's the two areas, uh, Japan and China, and then it seems like it's sort of like almost closed, not closed all the way, but it appears to close. Yeah, exactly, exactly, so exactly. Like right, 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 Japan. right. This is exactly the main point of this also pla uh, placing this map in this way. He is trying to convince you that Japan is not that far away from the continent. If you take Shanghai as the center of the continent, then Japan is way, way east. However, if you take the perspective from here, and you will see that the small sea is like a Mediterranean, and the continent and Japan are from the very beginning interlocked. So this is the perspective I want to bring in, in the first place. And then let us try to relook at the map of East Asia. So there are many routes connecting the islands of Japan and the main continents. So the first one is actually here. So here, here. <laughs> so the Ainu people, as you know, they are connected with the continents from the very beginning. And their ships, their boats, help them to bring their fishing and hunting technology from the continent. And they, it's very easy to cross the sea there. And then during our fourth, fifth, sixth century, this strait means nothing to these travelers by that time. So later, even during the uh, Mongol Yuan Dynasty, when they try to invade Japan, the idea they have is to take the boat from here, and then here, and then try to land themselves here. So this is a very short distance. And then we come to a third route. The third route takes, starts here, from the continent, try to reach the heart of Japan via the sea routes. So by and large, before the year 1000, this is a very dangerous route. So there are many reported shipwrecks. It's very dangerous. But after the year of 1000, it's getting much and much better, technically speaking. So the major change here is that there's new kind of boats. So it's, it has waterproof compartments, which technically means even one part of the boat is bro broken. It will not sink. So it's a little bit like modern boat building. 
So thanks to this technology, so Japan and the East Asian continent are very well connected from the very beginning. And this is the historical world that I study. More specifically, my research focus a particular kind of document, which is imperial edict. So edict is a document by which the emperor or the ruler declares something, pronounce something, try to communicate something with you. So my research focus on this and my argument by and large is help to help us to rethink what is unique about the political tradition of the East Asia world. So if we speak of the European world, American world, we might see we might say, well, democracy, we have great democracy. However, in modern times, we are always trying to see the East Asian political tradition in a very negative way. So the absence of democracy, so what they have. So my basic, my research trying to use these kind of documents to help us to think the political tradition from within. So today, we are going to look at one of them. So this is an imperial edict conferring posthumous title on a Buddhist priest, Enchin. So this is a calligraphy. So the first thing I must emphasize is it's preserved as a calligraphy, but in the very beginning, it is not a calligraphy, but an imperial edict. So the question I would like to walk us through are what follows. So first, it is concerned with a monk, right? So who is this monk? Why is he important? Where did he live? So I'm trying to connect things with yesterday, right? And the second, we are going to talk about what is an imperial edict? Why an edict is relevant here? Or what is a posthumous title? Why a monk needs a posthumous title? And why the emperor is conferring a posthumous title to a monk? Is this something bizarre, something strange there? Why not someone else? And then we are moving to calligraphy. So what kind of cal calligraphy it is? So why is it so valued that people bother to preserve that? If you receive an appointment letter, for example, from your school or university, I do not preserve that because it's printed, right? So this one is preserved because of its calligraphical beauty. So why is it? And then we are going to the fourth part. So the paper behind. Actually, this is a very refined paper. And there's a rumor going on that in 20th century, there's still some paper made of the same technology. And there are Chinese painters of 20th century try to purchase this pa uh, paper. So why? So they can fake ancient paintings. And <laughs> when you go to scan this paper with your modern technology, and the technology can date precisely where does the paper, when does the paper come from, right? And they will say 10th century. So this is the period when this edict is composed, right? So why is this paper so good? And throughout this process, by reviewing all this, I'm going to show you some Chinese influence with regard to that. And in this process, I want to make a further question. So how were Chinese ideas and technologies relevant? And the questions behind is rather how to think about this Chinese influence, right? So by and large, we can conceive two arguments. So from the Chinese side, the Chinese nationalists will say, well, everything great comes from China. <laughs> then we turn to the Japanese side. The Japanese nationalist argument will be, well, everything originates from China, but the great part is invented in Japan. <laughs> So throughout this process, we would like to see how we can go beyond these very nationalistic narratives. So how, how, how can we, standing here, moving beyond these nationalistic narratives? So let's start. Oops. So this is the monk Enqing. So he lives in the 9th century, and he is a monk of Tendai. So anyone help us? So what is Yesterday's lecture contents, what is Tendai? Any suggestions? No? Well, so let me do the job. So by the 9th century, there are many, many, many different sub-schools, sets of Buddhist studies. And Tendai is one of the synthetic approach to that. What does that mean to be a synthetic? 
you have meditative skills, right? You have doctrinal stuff, right? And you have concrete instructions on how to preach, how to deal with the dead, how to deal with the rituals in Tendai, and how to deal with the architectures that we will cover later. And Tendai is one of the very influential approach during the ninth century that synthesizes them together, tell you that to practice Buddhism in every aspect, it has to do it in this way. So this is the briefest introdu introduction. And by the same time, he uh, uh, ancient lives in the world with Anning. Anyone heard of Anning? So I think he is in the textbook. No. So Anning is another monk, another Japanese monk. So he traveled to China to learn how to do this stuff correct. So by the way, I heard that when you talk about Buddhism, you will think of meditation, right? Suffering, right? What else do you think of? Enlightenment, Enlightenment right? What else? Karma. Pardon me? Karma. Yeah, very good. What else? Discipline. Very good. Discipline. Closer. What else? Meditation. Very good. So many of you mentioned some ideas, right? Practices, very philosophical ideas. But on the same time, Buddhism is about very concrete things. Discipline is very important. So you need a very, very detailed guidance about how to discipline yourself. There are huge debates in India, in Central Asia, in China, in Korea, and in Japan about disciplines as detailed as how to clean your teeth. And also, Buddhism is about technology, technology in that world, of which you will not think as technology today. For example, how to dispel demons. And in Tibetan, even late as 17th century, the technology concerns how to summon a storm so as to destroy the farmland of your rivals. <laughs> these are technologies. And some of these technologies are related to Buddhism. And some of them deals with the living. So how to chant so as to dispel illness, sickness. And some of them deals with the death, the afterworld. So what will, ha what will actually happen when you die? So these people are concerned with. And the rival of Enqing, who is Anning, traveled to China to learn how to do these things correct. And Anning left a very detailed diaries. And he will write down how to do the chanting in different circumstances. For example, when someone died, and we are going to do the chant, who will step first? What dress he will dress? And who will follow him? And how many circles they will go? And then how to conclude that? These are technologies, ideas. It's just an it's, technology in this world is not just about wonderful things I will show you later, how to make paper, useful things like that, but also these stuff. Oops. So this is the travel routes of Anning. So he traveled all the way to China and via the sea route, and he is lucky and he arrived, but some of his co-travelers died right after arriving in China. And then he is also a little fortunate to have witnessed a very grand persecution of Buddhism in China. So and then this is why he left. Otherwise, he may still uh, stay in China for a longer period. And the reason for him coming to China, learn all these details, is to go back to Japan and tell his Japanese fellows that this is the right way of doing things. And this has a very concrete context of rivalries among different teachings in Japan. What is also interesting thanks to recent research is that you think any come to China to see the Chinese stuff, right? Actually, it's not so because he is a Japanese monk and he reads Chinese, writes Chinese, but he does not speak Chinese. So he has a translator, oral translator, who comes from here, Sila who is a Korean by modern standard, right? This Stila translator is a very devoted Buddhist. So he wants Anning to see the very practices that according to the Stila monk, which is correct. So what Anning actually witnessed is to a substantial extent shaped by the vision, the 
particular beliefs of this Korean, of these Korean monks. So this opens a particular page of interaction of the ninth century. And now let's let, 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 let's turn our sight to more concrete stuff. So this is a temple. This is a temple, actually, uh, the temple where Enchim resides for a substantial part of his life. This is called Ongjoji. And anyone has been to come this one? Any particular thoughts on this? Yeah? yeah. Great. So what is unique <laughs> about that? So you will see. This is a well construction detail of a Tang style temple, reconstructed by a 20th century uh, scholar based on another temple uh, in northern China. And it is based on this model that a lot of uh, temples of the medieval East Asia was built. There's some details you might see the difference. So you don't have this part here, this part here. It's not so substantial at this moment. What it actually tells you is how to arrange the main hall. So you see here. So the statue should be here. And it, what it tells you is that how tall this statue should be with regard to the height of this beauty. This is concrete numerological knowledge. So this part should not be higher with regard to this. And these, th these are the specific regulations with regard to how to build a Buddhist temple. So in the 11th century, the Chinese government, which is the Song Dynasty, published a concrete regulation with regard to what to do at what moment and with regard to what. And it is out of this kind of idea that a temple like this is built. And again, here, if you actually visit this temple, you will heard very different narratives. If you go with a Chinese tour group, <laughs> these people will, t will tell you that, well, this comes from China, and in China this functioning in this way, but in Japan this has only appearance like that. <laughs> well, if you go to a Japanese tour group, trust me, they will say something very different. They will say, well, we do this thing right like. If you go to a concrete Chinese temple, they have lost this and that. <laughs> so at this moment, the dispute is already with us. And then this is the central question that we would like to chase throughout this talk. Before that, let's look at some details. So this one, can we see it? Well, the question here is how to connect this beam with that. So any of you has any experience with woodcraft? Great. What will you do when trying to connect to? You have to have the side brackets. Very good. So there are different ways. So in modern wood design, you can use nails, right? But if actually you go to an IKEA and purchase some furniture, <laughs> you will see very few nails, right? You will try to connect them with a particular kind of biting system. So that these metal parts will, will, will connect themselves together in a solid way. Well, the ancient, well, back to the 4th and the 5th century BC, the Chinese technicians were trying to experiment in that, and they have invented a concrete way. In Chinese, it's called the sun mao structure, one biting the other. What is good about that? It does not use a single piece of nail nor does it use a single piece of metal. So why is that important? Morning. Very good. So if you use things like that, well, in the pre-modern world, you don't have very high quality these nails. And they rot very frequent. And once they rot, the beam will fall, right? A second reason is that the, the, the wood is also rotting. If they rot, then the, the, the nail will cut it through. and the, tower or, or the, the hall will collapse very easily. So what is important is to let these wooden pieces to bite each other, connect them together in such ways. So there are stories about 
Korean um, uh, woodcraft uh, 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 woodsmen learning this from China, and they try to chant before they connect them, so that to make sure that they will not disconnect. So there's some well, even for people living there, there are some mysteries about that, showing that it's a very, very how to say advanced, sophisticated technology that makes all these medieval constructions possible. So any questions? Yeah? Do they use some sort of a glue or an adhesive or just purely wood to wood? Purely wood to wood. Yeah. Are they better for earthquakes? Yeah. Yeah. So what is that particularly good for earthquake is that if you use glue and when it shake, and then the glue will get how to say disconnected, right? If you bind it together and if you shake it together and then it will be still there. So they are organically together. Yeah? It's also much better for the weather because wood on wood will grow and expand yeah, exactly. and shrink together. Yeah, exactly. As opposed if you have a nail or something which is not flexible. Yeah, exactly. And also it's better to uh, it's better when how do you say fire? Yeah. If you have fire the nail will melt very easily. However, on the contrary, counter to our intuition, well, against our intuition, this wood is more fireproof. And there are particular regulations about where water should be stored around this wooden structure. So that whenever there's a fire alert, you can get them from the closest point. And the fire thing is, if anybody has a fireplace, you know, if you throw a full big log in and try to light it on fire, you can't do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that is a solid piece that right. protects that. Right. And it's yeah. but it's steel and cement, they are actually even more fragile. So let us catch up some time. So the second question we have raised about this is with regard to the edict. So the question here concerns us is that what does it mean that the emperor conferred a posthumous title to a monk? The posthumous title is very important before all, for all these people living in that cultural world. So you refer me uh, in terms of my name, right? Shofu, right? But in that world, you will not refer me through my name, but rather style name. After my death, you are not supposed to refer to me neither through my name, nor through my style name, but through my posthumous title. <laughs> so this is your name tag after you, this body passed away. So it mattered everything. So you want to have a beautiful posthumous name, right? If my posthumous name is Shofu the Handsome, maybe that's better than <laughs> Shofu the Ugly, right? I, I, I don't want a horrible posthumous name. Were they based on the way you lived your life? Exactly. Right? So this is based on the way you lived your life. And they are very limited characters. There's a sequence, each signifying some particular qualities. Question? Oh, so I yeah. Like an epithet, like Alexander the Great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, a little bit like epithet. They are somehow, uh, let me see, 70 to 100 characters which are frequently used. And you use two character, uh, 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 how to say, uh, combination for normal elites. But for Buddhists, it's a little bit different. But by and large, it's the same spirit. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So would it just only be get, an honor be given to elites? Or yeah. Okay, so it's yeah. within the upper levels of society that they would be given the, the posthumous name. Right, right. Technically, technically, you can, your, well, at your desk, you can give a posthumous title yourself proposed one, but that is not recognized. <laughs> the recognized one is approved through the imperial government. Then this is how the political authority entered through the elite society through the Chinese situation. And this definitely influenced Japan in a different ways. And this is what I am suggesting. So imperial government says the government headed by the emperor and the practice of Buddhist and other religion are intimately related in the Tang Dynasty on the one hand and in Heian Japan on the other. So early on, the Japan took the model of Chinese imperial bureaucracy and they are trying to implement that in Japan out of various reasons. And gradually, they realize that, well, 
that's too complicated. We, we, we really don't need that complicated bureaucracy. So then that bureaucracy evolved into Japanese fashion. And one of the, through the evolution, one of the substantial problems that the Heian Japan needs to address is the control of religion. So why is that important? Any guess? Why the religion needs to be controlled? If you are an emperor or governmental official, why do you want to control the religion? Yeah? yeah? Well, wouldn't you worry about, are people more loyal to you or are they more loyal to your religion? Yeah, very important. Money. Also? Money. Yeah, very good. Money. So there are very mundane reasons. So if someone is tonsured as a monk, right, he is registered in the Sangha, which means Buddhist community. Right. So he is released from the normal tax base of the Chinese style bureaucracy. As a result, if everyone goes to the Buddhist community, then as an imperial ruler, you don't have people to pay your tax. Right? This is the fundamental problem that the Tang wants to address. They want to limit the population of Buddhist monks. What do they do? is issue a certificate. So you need to get my certificate <coughs> in order to become a tonsured monk. And mm -hmm. then the imperial government can sell the certificate at a very high price. So that whenever there's a monk, you know that the government has already taxed. And you can also limit the number of people that can do that. Exactly. In the very beginning, the Japanese government wants to implement that, but they <coughs> failed. So they still have certificates, but they are emerged different centers of issuing these certificates as a result of which the centralization of that authority just collapsed. However, the ideas behind <coughs> is that it should be the imperial government controlling the Buddhist community in a different ways. And one of these ways is that it is the emperor who held the authority of issuing a posthumous title. It is not only to bestow honor to show that the imperial patronage of the imperial family with regard to this monk or this Buddhist teaching. There's an idea behind that the, the governmental authority should be there. On top of that, we can observe this edict in a closer way. So Japanese people are very, how to say, um, very serious learners. <coughs> and they try to learn this imperial edict. Well, if I want to implement the idea of edict, right, I just issue an edict in whatever way I want. But for these medieval, how to say, state builders, they try to imitate the exact format of this edict. So to write an edict is to write it in a certain way. Too hard for me. Stop. <laughs> this character means that the emperor he ordered. So when the Japanese visitors come to China, they annotate every part of this edict. On which part of the paper what should be written? So why is this so important? Any guess? Yeah, very good. But why we need the correct way is the Tang people did it. Can I just invent it so that in whatever format it can work, right? Does that show some connection with Buddhism between the two? Mm, interesting, but here it's not the connection of Buddhism, but rather, yeah? Maybe to avoid forgery or to infer that the power coming from China is also flowing through Japan and it is an imperial power. Very good. So there are two things. The first is that the format shows the bureaucratic structure behind this institution. So imagine you get a letter from, for example, IRS. the director of this uh, museum, right? So in order to get a signature, you will go to the next bureau, for example, the bureau of whatever, student affairs. And then you go to the next bureau, the bureau of financial management or whatever. So the sequence of these signatures shows that where the documents go first, right? Originally, according to the design. 
So the design, the template of this document reflected the ideal management of the bureaucracy, the paperwork, the information flow. That is something mattered. And then later, of course, the Japanese people will not follow that. But to follow the format, the sequence, the way of writing that means that they are following the idealized bureaucratic daily functioning. So you go to this bureau first, get this done correctly, and then you go to the next bureau and get their signature. Am I making sense? So to follow this format means that they recognize the very idea behind the very way the bureaucracy functions. In order to follow this way, the, what the Japanese collectors, travelers do is to collect as much of these edicts as possible. And very often, they're also a piece of art. They're concrete objects, they're calligraphy. So most of the surviving edicts appointing officials, conferring titles to monks or whatever, are preserved actually in Japan. Not in China, but in Japan. So this one is an edict appointing this guy, sorry, no English, Sima Guang as a grand counselor. And this is purchased oops, during the Ming Dynasty, which around 15th, 16th century by a Japanese art collector, supposedly and then it's still stored in Japan. By the way, so this guy, Sima Guang, actually you can see in this museum. So he is this guy here. This kid is one, this uh, huge scholar, grand counselor was still a kid. And what he was doing here, any guess? Pardon me? Is that a yeah, well, it's a huge pot, not a honey pot. So what is he doing? When he's upset. Yeah, exactly. So someone is drowning here. So he is trying to save this guy, right? How is he going to save this guy? If you climb this way, then you will fall. And he is too small to help this. Yeah, exactly. To break this pot. So this is a story connected to this guy, Sima Guang, to show how smart he is. Well, later he became a grand historian, scholar, counselor, statesman, whatever, everything good you want to attach to him. And even prior to the making of that, the Japanese people has already shown huge, huge interests in things related to him. And this edict appointing him as a grand counselor is thus deemed particularly important. You can still see the character here, right? This character is the imperial order. And all these are signatures of different governmental behoves. Again, this does not mean the actual flow of the document, but shows how idealized bureaucracy should work. And this part is all the kinds of cliche language showing how brilliant this guy is. <laughs> So the same thing, it, it, I, I show the edict conferring the posthumous title to the, 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 the deceased monk. So the major body is the eulogies, showing that how brilliant person he is. Uh, here. So the culture of formatting edicts and official documents in a particular way has a huge influence on later deployment of the Japanese documents and the political cultures. So anyone knows the board game? Go, ego. The black and white, black and white, yes, yes, right. <coughs> yes, right, so there's a black and white game, right? And if you're professional or if you're achieved, right, you will get a certificate, right? There are nine ranks. Rank nine is the top, right? And rank one is the lowest. And then there's another, anyway. So recently, the Korean Institute of Go issued a certificate to the artificial intelligence, right? The AlphaGo. <laughs> so now even the, 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 the how to say, artificial intelligence can get a certificate like that. Yeah. So this is a one of the certificates conferring such a rank of Go mastery to a particular Go master. And this is actually modeled upon the medieval way of appointing officials. 
if we have some other hour, we can show the connections in a more detailed way. I, I know you see some difference here. By and large, this is still the format. When the Korean people do the conferring title of uh, rank nine to the artificial intelligence. So now you can see the connections from the very medieval world of China to later deploy deployment of Japanese political culture and then to the Korean implementation of this kind of format, even today. So question, why is Korean using this Japanese format? Any guess? Well, because Korea at a certain point is colonized by the Japanese Empire, and the entire way of Korean certificate making is modeled upon the Japanese Institute of issuing these certificates. And this is an earlier document in, 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 in the Senkoku, the Warring States period, Japan, issuing an order. So all these official documents, they try to imitate the format according to which the traditional ones are fabricated in China. Again, let's catch up sometime. So the next question is, yeah, question? I just have a quick question. Yeah? Uh, it's not a proof that you are a gold master. It's proof that you reached this rank. So there's nine ranks. So everything, well, the Chinese people, well, back to the medieval period, they rank every skill into nine ranks. So gold is one of them. Poetry, painting, calligraphy, everything. Like, like the noble arts. Yeah, 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 like, 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 like that. They, they rank everything into nine. And the first one, well, the, the highest one is that you as if you enter the divine realm. So th they have a theory of doing that. And later, well not later, during the medieval career, they also rank the human, how to say, pedigree, or your innate bone in nine ranks. And in China, they rank official hierarchy in nine ranks. And they also rank your talents in nine ranks. Also in calligraphy, in go, in painting, everything, rank it into nine. And this is a document confirm, conferring the rank of this. So you have achieved this stage. Does that help? Yeah? Yeah, 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 it's fine. So like, who, does, it, does everyone have a card or just certain people? And then why do you recruit from the department of your ranking? Like, what's the reason uh, for that? I didn't get your second one, so. Okay, like So your question is concerned with why you hold this, right? Why you need that? So for two reasons. The first is that the ceremony itself marks your advance to a certain stage. It's like today we have ceremony of wedding, yeah, birth, adulthood. So this ceremony itself marks the transformative stage of yourself. And this is used as a token during that ceremony. First. Second, this is a document that will define who you are throughout, not only through your life, but also after your death. So you will have a sacrificial whore, and then these appointment edicts or these certificates will be placed there. And your descents will go back to these documents to when, when, when they're recounting your life. Yeah? So it's kind of like your college, you got your BA, Well, whether it's like your college degree, I'm not sure, yeah. Exactly. So it's a kind of document. Yeah, they document your achievements. Any significance right. with that number nine? Well, uh, good question. So the significance of number nine is deemed in the traditional, well, classical Chinese numerology is the extreme of numbers. So if you cannot count up to ten, the nine is the biggest, right? <laughs> well, or to put it in another way. In one digit numbers, among all one digit numbers, <laughs> nine is the top, right? So everything ranking to nine. So let's go to the calligrapher. So the calligraphers are, are fits in the aristocratic ethos of the Heian Japan in a particular way. And if you think of um, how to say today we, we, we do the manage of government in emails, right? This does not matter, right? So in these times, 
when you receive a document, the first thing you see is how it is written. Even before you start to decipher or read what the document is about, what it says, what you already see is the kind of characters you read, right? So the basic point here is that calligraphy in that world, both in China, Korea, and Japan, calligraphy is not a decoration of the document or a decoration of the power structure behind. It is part of it. So in order to show your imperial authority vis-a-vis -vis other power holders, both in China and in Japan, the court must issue documents with a higher calligraphical value. So if I am the emperor, I issue a document to you, and this is written terribly, and people will immediately think, well, something went wrong in the court. Some usurpers might be there, so that they don't know how to deal with it properly. So the proper order of the calligraphy is a part of the proper order of the universe, to put it in a simpler way. So this is what the, 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 the reading I have assigned is relevant. So it might be a little bit hard if you cannot recognize, you cannot read Chinese characters. Well, this means eternity. So what do you feel about that? Well, eternal, eternal. Longevity, <laughs> eternity, whatever. So what is your feeling about this character? The, I mean, this calligraphy. Any thoughts? It's very clear. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other reaction to that? It, it's balanced. It looks like it's balanced. Very good. Balance is very important. You can see you can draw a line here and here and here, right? So what else? Yeah, very simple. Yeah, exactly. So this is because this character is simple. So what else you might feel? Yeah. Pardon me? Yeah, strokes going to a different direction. Good. What else? It looks like a mountain to a certain extent. Yes. Yeah, but it's not directly connected. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. It feels very serious and official. And this is a world in which how you compose a character, people believe, reflect what kind of person you are. So who's that balance? Here, right? Yes. Serious, right? So if you are able to write it in a very serious, balanced way, it is believed that you have such kind of disposition. So this is also part of technology that is very important to that world, but are no longer relevant today. If you work in a personnel department here, you will not get a calligraphy and to say, well, this candidate, I'm a little bit worried, he is, well, people will be crazy with you, right? But in that world, it is true. So if you want to avail yourself as a candidate of the official government, or a monk, you want to get a certificate and you go to the exam hall sometime, at some point, you will submit your writing first and people will judge you on that. And you cannot say, please don't judge me by that. This is not me. No, this is you. <laughs> so here are two of the masters of the medieval China, Wang Xizhi and Yan Zhenqing, which is, yeah. So they would not be just judged on the content of the writing, like the ideas, but how it would be exactly. well. Yeah, exactly. So how it is written. It's very, very important. Yeah. Uh, Dino mentioned balance, but I actually see the ability to put a circle completely around this character, like yeah. the spokes of a wheel. Right. Very often circles represent eternity, no beginning, no end. So like I could like if I don't know about in I know in other religions and the form of the circle and what they look at, but so is that part of the balance? Um it's not exactly so because it's happened to be that way, but the balancing stuff takes more. This is a line here, right? Yeah. You put your stroke up to here, right? The question is, this part should be more or less uh, symmetrical, and you must put a tail out of it to show some, how to say, a further sense of balance. It's not just symmetrical. Symmetrical itself indicates some kind of awkward, but you need to be able to stretch yourself a little bit in a proper way as if your personality. 
If you do anything just according to what the regulation writes, you're more or less stubborn, right? <laughs> so you're, you need able to demonstrate this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So this is a calligrapher who composed that edict, who is the a really, really great master of the medieval Japan. And he is still, well, sometimes he, I, I talk to modern or contemporary learners of Japanese calligraphy, and they refer to him as the god of calligraphy in a certain way. Well, I, I know you cannot read this, but any intuitive reaction to this one? Let's take a little <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so as a reaction to that one, you cannot read it. But any feelings? Yeah. As, as you go left, it's more abstract. Yeah, very good, very good. Some parts are very abstract. Yeah, very good. What else? Yeah. It reminds me of the ocean. Oh, really? Wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. Very good. What else? Yeah. It strikes me as moving away a little bit more from the standard to his own particular flair of style. Very good. Let me come comment on this part. So first, this is a very, very, very famous piece because Different characters are written in different styles. So in the traditional China, there are different famous masters, each, how to say, establishes a style of his own, right? In this one, uh, the calligrapher is trying to show that I can master all of them. <laughs> so whatever calligraphy you previous Chinese masters has achieved, I can do it, and I can do it in one piece. And by the way, this is a poem of a very, how to say, popular, influential um, Chinese poet. Think of him as whom? Lord Byron or... <laughs> anyway, so very influential, very popular. And then he is trying to show that I can write this poem and I can write each character in a very different style, epitomized what the spirit of one past diseased Chinese monster. Is that amazing? And then we can go back to your point. So he is not only doing so. For example, if you recite a poem, you will recite a rhythm, right? You will not say like a machine to be or not to be, right? You will put some passion to be or not to be. <laughs> this is like that. So different style is trying to encapsulate a certain rhythm, certain emotion, certain passion, certain engagement with different elements of this poem. So some, last sentence, some commentator is trying to say that by this calligraphy, he rendered sound back on the paper, even it's two-dimensional question. I agree with you. Oh, thank you. I was going to ask if the thickness of the stroke equals tone and inflection, or you know, so the, the sound you're saying that's coming back, it, it's prosody, like the, so on the left, very light. Yeah. Last two strokes, which is very rhythm, almost a tune. Yeah. And then right next to it, the extremely thick, bold strokes. Yeah. Is that is that to be spoken with more emphasis? Right, right, right. Right there. Yeah. Some of what you said is true, but uh, the point is that not to make this thing too how to say symbolistic. Symbolic. So if symbolic, yeah. If you read a Byzantine painting or pre-Renaissance medieval art, you will say it's a very symbolic art, right? Jesus Christ, in this position, symboli symboli symbolizing that doctrine, right? But don't read that in that way. So it's a more holistic approach. So here, this is the character for nothingness. So you can see he is enlarging that, emphasizing on that, as if, if you're drunk and you recite a poem, you will make some syllable really long, right? <laughs> so you're actually emphasizing that, right? Now, by written, by writing, he is utilizing the same technique. Is that clear? Yeah? Is it like kind of like the same idea as like when you're typing or texting and like you write in all caps? Yeah. Yeah. Like the same idea, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like some yeah, design poem. You write long with a lot of O's. But yeah. Question? Uh, I think average person cannot, but if you are educated and lead, right. first, you can recite this poem. Right. So this is a very 
not household poem, but if you're educated elite, probably you know that poem. And by and large, if you have already encountered this one and then you read it, then you can get it. And the second is that you have raised a very good, very good point. So the appreciation of calligraphy is somehow related to the recognition of characters, right? If you want to see this character, you want to appreciate why is it good, you will think of how previous masters composed their characters, right? In order to do that, you need to recognize that, right? And this goes to my next point, actually. Uh, no slide, anyway. So during this period, and later in China as well, artists are trying to experiment new approaches. They intentionally write characters in ways that you cannot recognize them. Why? They want you to appreciate the aesthetic value without referring to what character it is. What does it remind you? Art. Exactly. So you might think cubism, futurism, or this abstract art, or Picasso, or whatever. So they want to deter your effort to recognize what it is. And then they want to invite you to appreciate its beauty first, and then think of other questions. This is later in Japan, and also in the 17th century, another Chinese calligrapher is trying to do that in a more systematic way. And then, yeah, in the 20th century, both Japanese, Korean, Chinese calligrapher further explores that approach. But to a certain extent, we can, it's, it's less so here, it's some, some centuries later. Yeah, but thank you for your question. Any other? Oops. Now let's move to paper making. Yeah, paper making. So we all know that paper making comes from China. So uh, let's to appreciate in a more concrete way. So I want two volunteers. Who want? Yeah, another? Yeah, thank you. So please come here and what I need you to do is, so, uh, paper making use this. This is the raw material for paper making. And then you use this. This is, uh, how to say, mode for making paper. Let's see whether you two can succeed. <laughs> so, brief instruction, you put this into this. Okay. And then you get it, how to say? Stir. Stir together, and then you pour it on this three times. Well, you pull, you pull the entire stuff in three times. Am I making sense? And then let it stay in that, uh, stay there for a while. Okay, so let's watch a small video while our friends are experimenting paper making. So now they are showing the raw materials. First you need good water, and then you need a certain particular species of plants. And then you will pack them, you will dry them a little bit so that you can easily strip them. It's the stripped part that matter more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they measure them carefully. It's not a random, uh, uh, they, they calculate how many part. And it's the textile of these, uh, how to say, plants that matter for paper making most. Yeah, and then they were trying to extract these textile stuff, and then they merge it to water. So you don't necessarily need this. You can use other kind of stuff. You can use rackets. You can use clothes. You can use whatever. But they make different kinds of paper. So in medieval China, as in Japan today, each workshop of these paper has their protecting deities. So sometimes in order to produce the highest quality, they will show do some sacrifice before doing that. Now this is the most important part as we 
our fellows are, are, are experimenting. So you have this stuff. So I have brought that. So you are using the liquid. Let the liquid passing through that. So some textile will remain on that because water are very thin, right? These liquid are solid or are more solid. So they will remain on this paper. And then you try to get this water off. Yeah, you're doing that brilliantly. <laughs> to let this water flow, get them go. <laughs> yeah, you're at this stage, very brilliant. So this is the most dangerous part. If you hurt the paper, then everything is gone. Any observations? So what is your, yeah? Well, a more traditional way is that each time you do one layer, yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah, very good. So this is the direction we are shooting. So previously in China, so well, paper, how to say, crafters, they are registered separately in the civil registration system. So for example, in the town, I am registered as a peasant. You are registered as a soldier. And he is registered as a merchant. And you are registered as a paper maker. However, in Japan, it changed a little bit. It's, you must think the economic system in a more binaural way. So this means that, for example, I am a particular aristocrat, or I'm a temple, and I have huge fields, and I have many dependents, and some of them specialize in paper making. And then they will make paper, and I, 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 I will feed them, and they will submit their paper to me. And then I have particular agents checking the quality. And I want this paper quality to be good because, it you? yes, it represents me in a very aristocratic culture. So imagine in a salon, right? So each sharing different stuff and I, I, I have scrolls in better quality. But also it's because of Buddhist ideas, because copying these scriptures is a particular way of showing devotion. And you would like to copy them upon particularly good paper. Go back to your next question. So whether they will sign their name, by and large, no. In the modern times, yes, they are brands or whatever, but in this period, they are not allowed to sign. Uh, it applies to other industry as well. In China, for example, you make pots, right? If you are working for an imperial kiln, kiln, K-I-L-N, you're not supposed to sign that, but some of them will sign it in a secret way. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's fine. But if you craft a steely, then these people can sign. But for the paper makers, they cannot. What they can do is using this wonderful stuff. For example, this is a flower, right? When you are doing that, you can put some flower on that. As a result, which? Exactly. This is the kind of love letter paper you will purchase. In, 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 yeah. Also, you can use this little catty stuff to make your paper in a particular shape, and you can combine this. So this is to make it fancy. But by and large, to go back to your question, is that different workshops of paper will produce different paper in different style. The basic point I want to emphasize behind that video is that it's very labor intensive. And it requires a huge level of co cooperation. It's not something that three or five people can do it. Right? Well, <laughs> you are making that small part. <laughs> and the key point is that uh, the producer has already made this. <laughs> but if you are going to do that out of the workshop, then it will be particularly different. So it involves a level of organization. Accordingly, so how to organize this paper industry become a substantial problem in later Korea, Japan, and also China. This is a case of late imperial China. So this is a paper making workshop. So any observation, any suggestion? So this guy is drawing them, right? 
So, and then they are negotiate a price, and these are buyers, they are checking the qualities, right? These papers are used, well, in this size, they are used for calligraphy and painting. They are not used for printing industry. So painting industry, by that period, they started to utilize a different kind of paper that aims to minima, minimize their price. So that's why by 1600, there are a huge amount of fictions, novels, printed in China. And they are small. Sometimes they are very, how to say, low of taste, many bizarre jokes, erotic jokes, whatever. And they aim at the popularity so that the publisher can earn something. So they start to use really, really low quality paper as well. But this is for literati um, painting and calligraphical practice. So they purchase this really good paper, and then they try to, how to say, paint something or write something, and then they will put it on a scroll. This is a later Chinese development of this paper making that involves a particular level of specialization. During this process, many workshops of traditional Tang and Song paper making just dies out. They are replaced by new kinds of workshops, specializing in different things. So certain workshops specialize in really, really cheap paper. Certain workshops specialize in really sick paper. And paper is also used for different stuff. For example, if you eat a uh, croissant, you will use a uh, wrapping paper, right? There are workshops specializing in that as well. However, what is truly remarkable in Japan is that even during the Edo period, which is early modern, so still many Tang and Song style paper making workshops still survives and flourishes. This is what they call Japanese paper, so the washi. Heard of that? So if, if you still go to Daiso, or you go to any Japanese uh, store here, they will tell you this is a traditional Japanese paper making, right? So the video we watched early on is a clip showing you that they are still using that technology. So why is it important, or why is it remarkable? Any thoughts on that? Um, yes, but the fact that they survive indicates that there's a market and they have profit, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's not just utility, but there's a particular value attribute to that, right? What else? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I must emphasize first, it's a rumor. Well, <laughs> the rumor itself reflects the contemporary perception of Japanese craftsmanship. So they are preserving certain things from the past, right? But on the other hand, the point is that this really traditional way of um, producing paper, they're actually replaced in Ming China on a very large scale and replaced by new technology of making them satisfy new needs. However, in Japan, they, still, they are still much valued for some reason. And the question is, why? What, are, what might be these reasons that they still survive in one way or another? Any suggestions? Yeah? Well, I would think it has to do with the Shinto religion, because plants and you know, the spirit of the plants is in the paper. Well, it's a, a good direction to go, right? So there's devotion. And then in China as well, uh, it applies more to the ceramics making. Because when making ceramics, so you put this stuff into the kiln, right? What will come out of that has some level of, how to say, arbitrariness, right? So every time you go there, you will pray to the deity, protector of this industry. You want to make sure that you get exactly what you want. Very often you put a thousand into that, maybe three is what you like. So if the industry is like that, you will yeah, truly pay attention to, 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 to the deity side. But paper making is slightly different. Any yes, suggestion? Yeah.
Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, this is the direction we are going. So means that certain cultural forms continues in this uh, in the Japanese society, and it's, there's a strong insistence that in cer well, certain cultural forms are associated with certain patterns, paths of ideas and technologies. For example, the certificate certifying that you reach this level of uh, go playing. You need to write the document in a particular way. And you need the paper to be made in a particular way. And in this paper, you will add certain, not flower, leaves in a particular way. And this is the traditional art. This is how this functions in this society. And the next question that we won't have too much time to explore is why these traditional cultural forms because are, remain so important for example, in the 18th century literati circle in Japan, or 19th century, or even 20th century. So now, let's harvest your paper. Is that okay? So you want to show us? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's your paper. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's see. Well, it's, it's yes. imperial quality. Yes, yeah, it's wonderful. So you will open this. And then you will try to see whether you can tear it off. Uh, it's still too wet, but you can see it's already a piece of... Oh, I'm sorry! <laughs> you can already see that you can tear it off in a certain way. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, let, let, let's dry it, it for some more minutes. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah and we, we, we have one more blue one, so anyone who's interested can take it back and show your student how to make that. So as time is constrained, let's do a summary. So we started with a scroll. We did not read that, decipher that, translate that, but we analyze ideas and technologies behind that. So what we have, so in the beginning, we have the idea of Tendai Buddhism, right? It's a Tendai monk, right? As he passed away, and then we have the imperial edict conferring a title to him. And then we visited the temple of his residence, right? And we see how wooden connections of these traditional Chinese yeah, craftsmanship help us, well, help to bind these wood pieces together and present you a very brilliant medieval temple, right? And then we go to the idea of imperial government. The government, the bureaucracy, the emperor that did everything, right? And then we go through the prop the proper format of official document. In order for a government to function, you need paperwork, and to, in order for paperwork, you need format, right? And then we go to the zeal for collecting Chinese edicts. We see the, 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 the edict for Sima Guang, the kid who broke the jar or pot or whatever. And then we visit some Chinese calligraphy, trying to appreciate a little bit. And then I try to convey these ideas into connection between calligraphy and authority. And finally, we come to the idea of paper making, right? So this is the point to revisit our very original question, right? And one, one way, one possibility of interpreting all of them is that they all come from China, right? Well, Buddhism comes from India, but t Tendai Buddhism comes from China, right? So now it's the specter of nationalism that buzzes us, right? From a Chinese nationalistic point, well, all of them come from China, so Japanese takes all of them. Well, and on the other hand, we can still have an or very Japanese-centered narrative. We will say it is the Japanese people that bring these stuff to a level of perfection and bring them into the modern world. Tendai Buddhism, they're still active in Japan, and through the 19th and 20th centuries, they are reintroducing China. Well, Re well, I cannot say re revitalized. Well, the revitalized. not exactly revitalized. The growing public image of Tendai in China has a certain influence from Japan. Yes, that, that, that's better. And then the wooden connections, these constructions, well, there remain some temples in modern day North China, in Shanxi, in other places, but many of them are actually preserved in Japan. In China, they are burnt, they are destroyed. If not by fire, by, but by then by the Cultural Revolution or whatever. And then the imperial government, to give you examples, the certificate certifying you achieved a certain rank of sports, right? Go playing 
It's only active in Japan. Now China has a similar bureau, but they issue this certificate in a Soviet communist way. <laughs> so th th that is the lineage of the document format. And then calligraphy, yes, in China, but yeah, paper making we just ma mentioned. So it, it's rather in Japan that these papers are still made in that way. So in China, they develop toward a different go, different direction. So now we have another possibility to interpret them entirely in a Japanese-centered way, right? So all these things, they have origins, some origins, or they can be big back to China, but their perfection, their format, as we receive today, is a part of our modern life. There's a contributor solely of the Japanese people. So what is the problem? Any suggestion? So eh, eh, well, we don't need to do a vote, right? <laughs> Which interpretation do you prefer? We don't do that. Yeah, any? I just have an observation. It's sort of like Japan is a curator of certain Chinese culture. You know? Yeah, exactly. This is a kind of sentiments that really, how to say, buzzard or cautions these, um, how to say, nationalists in East Asia. So some people will say the Korean people preserve a lot of Ming Chinese stuff or the Japanese people preserve a lot of Tang Chinese stuff. But this is, I cannot say the wrong direction, but this is somehow ill-motivated because these people, well, neither Japan nor Korea nor any country is a curator of any other country. So they collect these stuff, preserve them, utilize them for particular purposes. A hint to that is what I have mentioned early on is through the travel of Enning. Do you remember the monk who traveled China to learn how to chant, to learn how to do these Buddhist rituals correctly? Their purpose is not to preserve these practices as they are done in China. Their purpose is rather to address rivalries, argumentations or competitions very active in Japan. So they can show their fellows, well, this is a thing that is still done in China, and we take it through that guy, and this must be the right way of doing things. And in this way, they keep that and revitalize that in a certain direction. So still go back to the question. So we can apply this let us say dilemma or problematic to other stuff. So I, I know today's theme is sword, right? So the Japanese sword making learn a lot, well, has some origins through the Tang sword making. However, Tang is 618 to 907. However, up to the 11th century and 12th century, the sword become one of the very important exports from Japan to the Song China, because Song is making war against their northern partners, Jurchens, Kitans, whatever. Because one leading trade, one leading exports. So we can reproduce the argument in a certain way that even though these swords, these wonderful swords, originally somehow in Chang'an in the Tang Dynasty, it's the Japanese people, rather long before the modern centuries, that achieved a level of perfection in this kind of art skill and then re-influence the world. So which, inter well, any suggestions, which narrative you like or what problems you identify with any of the narrative? So am I making sense? Yeah? Well, okay, and this is gonna get into the lesson that they're gonna be seeing yeah. shortly. Um, the whole idea of trade, uh, you don't just bring things in, you've got something to, to exchange are unbelievably valuable as, as, as trade goods, uh, which allows the Japanese to bring even more stuff in to Japan. So I, I, I kind of like that narrative. It's, it's two-sided. It's an exchange. Yeah, very good. The idea of exchange is truly good. And the point I would like to suggest is that sometimes these ideas and technologies are more like stimulators, right? It takes their stimulus and then you react to that to a certain way. In historical context, you react to these stimulus not exactly for the purpose of being memorialized, right? Um, you have more concrete goals. And in different historical societies, different historical contexts, uh, 
you have different goals, you have different immediate challenges you need to confront, right? For example, if I am commissioned to make a coffee, my purpose is not to make a coffee that will last forever, right? My purpose is to satisfy you who is right before me. So later, well, through the historical processes, the Chinese societies, the Japanese societies, and the Korean societies, they have their different immediate challenges. And then they utilize these ideas and technologies to do certain things. So it's not a very good, for me personally, a very, it's not a very, how to say, sophistic approach to judge that if you preserve something it is by default advanced, then change it in a certain way. A more productive way of seeing that is how these different stimulus different ideas and technologies functioned in the transformation of different societies and how we can get something informative out of that. This is by and large the direction, the hint I would like to suggest today. And if it makes some sense, I will be very happy. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So, <laughs> so this is Fro. Uh, this is an edict conferring an posthumous title to a monk. Right, we have been repeating that point. And then why the government do that is not to endow a calligraphical masterpiece to us, right? They issue this document to do concrete things in their context. And in this context, the purpose is to show that imperial patronage of this particular sect. Why this is important in this context? This context is 927. 926 is Daigo Tenno. Anyway, so it relates to the imperial family. And it's the complex network of different temples and different aristocrats. So if you are the emperor sitting there, if you're the imperial court sitting there, you don't want anyone to rise and to, how do you say, under, to the extent that undermine your authority. You would like to play off to a certain extent. So they get this, and they get this, and they get recognized to that extent, and they get to that. So this is a context to show that the imperial court is not only patronized the school of any, but also they are paying substantial attention to the school of Enchi. So they would like to make both of these Tendai schools to flourish in order to balance, to a certain extent, if I can be how do you say, more social power driven at this moment, mm -hmm. to balance these schools. So back to our point, Republic, this means... The Republican, the oil companies giving to folks that are... Kind of, yeah. <laughs> the point is that they are not a curator of different Tendai teachings. They are not preserving Tendai teachings as they are in order to present us with the genuine medieval teachings. No, they are playing the game of power. Mm -hmm. And this is the access to the particular assets of Japanese society that you won't see, well, at a certain level you will see such playing off in Korea, but in China it's less so. Why? Because none of these Buddhist sects can rise to a certain level that undermines, the, well, challenge the imperial authority in any sense. So that's why you don't have these kind of power conflicts in China. In China, you will get these kind of documents via another way. The monk or the temple receives that will very proudly show off. So how you show off a very tender scroll like this? You cannot circulate it. People will destroy that. You inscribe it on a huge stele, on stone, and then you put it right before your temple, actually back to your temple so that visitors passing through will see a huge stone. It's so huge so that people cannot read. But there's a small tag next to it telling you that it's issued by this emperor. It becomes a way that different temples to contain their status in a very booming economy because people come here to donate, to purchase your service. And this means a lot to them. So let's go back to my argument in a certain sense. That is the different later, how to say, social political context that makes these ideas different. And it will be interesting to chase their evolution. <laughs>